Hello and welcome to Bowler CBT Labs. My name is Matt Bowler and in this video we'll be taking a look at the Cisco IOS zone-based firewall and its implementation using the Cisco Configuration Professional and we'll be looking at an intro to implementing the Cisco ASA, the Adaptive Security Appliance. And we'll be accessing and configuring it using the command line as well as the ASDM. We'll begin with our topology here. We have my laptop, which has a loopback, connects directly to RTR1, router 1. Router 1 connects to ASA1, and ASA1 connects to a web server. We'll be testing connectivity from my laptop over to the web server in order to demonstrate some of the features of the firewall inspecting traffic and allowing traffic see the difference between those two we'll configure the zone pairs the zones and the policy and once we get that set up on router one we will then open up and allow access to the asa which will allow us to manage the asa through the asdm there will be some preliminary configuration that we do on the asa through the command line which is a prerequisite to using the ASDM. We'll go ahead and walk through that and discuss some of the features that are available to us initially as we start looking at the ASA and building a, a basic policy performing a NAT, a couple of different NATs. So let's start out with router one here. We have the inside interface. 172.16.1.0 slash 30. That's the LAN where the inside interface of the router and my laptop sit. And then there's a handoff between the router and the ASA. It's 192.168.2.1. And actually this should be 192.168.2.2 slash 30. We'll notice that the inside interface of the router and the outside interface somewhat correlate to the inside interface of the ASA and the outside of the ASA. So our flow from the most trusted networks outbound would be this LAN is the most trusted flowing outbound to the ASA, which may be kind of like an edge device that goes out to the internet. And uh, for the sake of an example, this is where our, our web server would reside. On the outside interface of the ASA. It's very simple, but we'll be able to demonstrate the way the access lists work and the firewalls work, especially the zone based on the router, and then the access list based on the ASA. On the router, in order to access using the Cisco Configuration Professional, we'll need to make sure the device has an IP address. We'll need to make sure that it's running the HTTP server. And we need to make sure that we have a username, a local user, some sort of way that we can authenticate when we actually try to connect to the device. Before I get into using the Cisco Configuration Professional, uh, I will start out by saying I always launch it by running as administrator run into problems running it just uh, as a regular user and not forcing as administrator. There's also some compatibility issues that I have encountered with <clears throat> the versions of Java. So I had to downgrade to Java version 17045. So that's what I currently have enabled on my system. And I haven't uh, run into any issues to note with this version while running the Cisco Configuration Professional. There were some formatting issues with the GUI on the CCP. And after doing a little bit of searching online, I found that the way to uh, fix that problem is it's a compatibility view issue so what we need to do is go into tools and in internet explorer 
select compatibility view settings and add in the 127.001 right here. So we want to add this website and that allowed uh, the page to format properly when the, the GUI actually loads. So the two devices, we actually only need this top one. And we can see the username is Matt. The password is also Matt. If we wanted to connect via HTTPS or SSH, we would select this box over here. You can see when you mouse over, it says connect using a secure protocol. We'll just go ahead and connect over HTTP and we'll have it automatically discover the device. Down here in the community information area, we can see the IP that we entered. It's non-secure. It's in the process of doing a discovery of the device. During this time, it should pull the router host name and fill in this field. I can click discovery details. Oh, and it failed. Now let's see if we can ping. Take a look at the interface and see that it looks okay. It's up. It's up at 10 full, but it's not receiving anything. Okay, let's see here. Maybe it just needed a little jolt. There we go. That yeah, must have been something wrong at the logical level there. Okay, so now we should be able to discover the device. GNS3 is, is great. I really, really like using it, but sometimes it's, it's a little bit flaky. Okay, you can see our router host name has been discovered. If we pull up the details, you can see it pulled the device version. The platform is giving us a warning saying that the 3725 is not supported by the, the CCP. And I have run into some problems with the IPS. I believe in order to get that working, I had to use a 3600 series image. But for what we're doing here, we won't run into any issues with the basic zone based firewall configuration. In order to give a little bit of an overview of the CCP, we'll just we'll browse around the interface here and see what all we have available to us. It's a little bit of configuration that we can take care of through the uh, the, uh, the GUI here, uh, one of which is a route. So 
jump into the well, well we'll look at the interface management first here if we go over to edit interfaces and connections we can see a breakdown of three interfaces that are installed two of which are up we have descriptions the fast ethernet 00 IP address and that's going to my loopback adapter and then we have fast ethernet 10 the IP address and that's going to ASA1 on its uh, its gig 0 or eth0 and that that's the ASA's inside interface we can also see down here a rundown of what all is configured within the interface itself is there any sort of NAT applied, ACLs, IPsec, or inspections? So we can get uh, a pretty quick, decent overview of the interface configurations just at a glance here. I prefer the CLI, but it's good to know that we have these available in a, in a GUI fashion. You can see there are some basic settings with the router that we can edit here under the router options like hostname, domain name, banner, password. We can configure date and time, NTP. We can also manage the router access methods. So here we have the local user database now the VTY line configurations as well. So if we want to do apply access lists or change any of the default values or the input or output protocols, we can take care of that here. There are management access policies. And there's also the SSH configuration. So this is telling us that a key exists and SSH is enabled currently. There's also a DHCP features, pools, and bindings, all manageable through the GUI. There's also DNS, so we can see DNS is disabled. There's a dynamic DNS configuration as well. And there's static and dynamic routing. You can see RIP, OSPF, and EIGRP are all disabled, and there are no static routes currently configured. So what I would like to do is put in a default route we can select make this a default route instead of having to type out all those zeros and our next top will be the inside interface of the ASA so 192.168.2.2 And we can see the command preview here, IP route, just a basic default route. We'll go ahead and deliver that. There's also options for AAA, our ACL management, NAT, QoS, PBR, performance routing. There's a router provisioning tool, which I have not actually used. A secure device provisioning. SNMP. Syslogging options. NetFlow configuration. And there's also the entire subsection for security, which is where we'll be working when we set up the zone-based firewall. We can go ahead and begin with that configuration. So we'll expand the firewall subsection here and take a look at the firewall components. The zone-based firewall works by allowing traffic or specifying which traffic is allowed between zones. By default, inter-zone traffic is denied intra-zone traffic is allowed. So when we have the inside zone and the outside zone, by default, 
traffic between zones is denied. So when I uh, go, go to start sending traffic across, it will be denied by the firewall. And I'll need to put in rules to allow that traffic. So we'll go ahead and create the zones first. We'll add, we'll call this zone the inside and we'll apply that to fast ethernet zero zero. You can see zone security inside. We're creating that zone and then we are going to the fast ethernet zero zero. Specifying that that interface is part of the inside zone. It's a zone member for the inside zone. And we'll make the outside zone. So you can have multiple interfaces associated with the zone. That's where the intra and inter zone traffic comes into play. You could have multiple interfaces that belong to the inside zone and the policy between those two interfaces would be allow by default because it's it's the same zone but if you're going between zones if you have two different interfaces and they're different zones and that traffic would be denied by default so fast ethernet one zero will be the outside zone same commands just with the outside specified next thing we need to do is create our zone pairs or we'll go first we'll jump over to the firewall and edit our firewall policy so we'll create a new zone policy our source zone will be inside destination zone will be outside we will go ahead and allow any traffic source and destination will be any just to simplify it and we will inspect the traffic so we can either inspect allow or drop if you're familiar with firewalls you'll know that uh, the cisco firewalls are stateful in this case when we are inspecting the traffic it is stateful so when i'm initiating traffic from the inside zone to the outside the router is going to track the connection let's say i'm connecting trying to ssh from the laptop over to the web server or connect to it on uh, on some random port if I just allow the traffic the traffic will be allowed out but when it comes back in the router is not going to maintain a state table for that connection in that pinhole that we poke through the firewall as soon as we go through if we come back and there's not a rule that is uh, the opposite or allowing it back in it will be denied however if we are inspecting the traffic it will make a note of it and then be expecting the return back so it's maintaining that state table and it knows that I'm sending a TCP request out and I am expecting a response back so don't it, it, we don't have to have specific rules configured in both directions to allow a single flow of traffic. If it's allowed outbound and we're inspecting the traffic, then when the response is returned, the router will automatically allow it. However, if we set it up to just allow, we will have to have an allow outbound. And then for the opposite zone pair, the outside to inside, we'll also need an access list. It says allow that connection back inside. And then drop simply means drop. So we're going to inspect our traffic. Oh, it's not going to let us do any. So let's do, we'll go ahead and add and we will include our source network.
and our destination network. Uh, let's, we'll, we'll do any outbound because there are several networks that we'll want to talk to. So the source network, the slash 30 mask, we'll be able to go to any destination. We will call this inside to outside. Okay. You can see we didn't specify any specific services, so all protocols will be inspected. And the commands which result, this is one thing I really enjoy about the STM and the CCP, the, the ability to preview the commands that are being sent, that are generated by the options that you've selected within the GUI. So we can see our access list from inside to outside correlates to the name that we had just given the traffic that we were uh, classifying. We're permitting IP, so any, from 172.16.0 on protocol IP to any. You can see there's a class map being created to inspect, and it's matching the access list that we had created inside to outside. There's a, a policy map that is created, and within the policy map, that's where we're, we're referencing the class map that's matching the traffic. So our policy map is going to match right here, this class map. It's going to inspect it, do not drop. And then we create the zone pair Referencing our source zone inside and our destination zone of outside. And then we specify the service policy right here, which is what we created and what is matching and referencing the match traffic of the class map. So you can see the cascade here. You create the access list where you're specifying which traffic is allowed. You have the class map, which is matching that traffic referenced within the ACL. The policy map says what to do with that traffic. And then the zone pair applies the policy map. So we should see some log matches here. If I attempt to ping across, to the ASA. Try and ping the router. There we go. Okay, so the router is responding. Oh, the ASA is not configured. But we should see some matches here. If we go over to monitor, security, firewall status, we should be able to get an idea of what's been allowed. Doesn't appear to be, let's see, let's keep this as a continuous ping. Go, we're, we, we need to manually monitor, initiate the, the traffic monitoring.
this will poll every 10 seconds. We can select the interval, the polling interval. We are not seeing that matched. So let's go back over to the firewall. Let's say we will allow this and see if it still allows that traffic to come back. And it might still be allowing this because it's going to the self zone, which is the router itself. So there's a, there's the, the self zone, which is is always present by default, and that's the router itself. Let's configure the ASA. It doesn't have any configuration on it, and we have to configure it through the command line anyway. And then we'll go back over to the CC, the the CCP and the zone based firewall. For the ASA, in order to get the ASDM up and running, we will need to specify an ASDM image. There is already one present on here. I actually uploaded it, uh, and it's just been sitting here. So right now, we have no IP addresses configured, but we can see that our two interfaces are up. In order to configure the interfaces, it's very similar to a router um, as far as assigning the IP address. There is a command where we need to name the interface, and that interface will be referenced in various parts of the configuration. Let's get a look at the topology here. So the Gig zero interface, the inside will be 192.168.2.2. We'll assign our IP address. And mask. It's already up, so we don't need to do a no shut. But we will need to name the interface. So this particular interface, gig0, is our inside interface. Call it inside. And we can see that the security level, by default, is set to 100. The inside interface, on a scale of 0 to 100, 100 being the most trusted and 0 being the least trusted, is by default going to to be 100. So the interface is trusted entirely. There are different levels of trust. When I go to the gig1 interface and assign an IP address, and name this one outside, we can see it will be the exact opposite. It's setting that to zero by default. The flow of traffic which is allowed through the ASA, the higher trusted zone to the lower trusted zone will always be allowed. Traffic from a lower trusted zone to a higher trusted zone will be denied. So if I'm working on my laptop over here, and I want to go out to the internet, my connection, since it's originating on the inside and going to the outside, will be allowed. However, if there's a new connection, which is initiated and seen at the ASA on the outside interface, attempting to come inbound, 
unless there's a specific rule which allows that traffic, the traffic will be denied. So if you have, you could have different layers and levels of security. You could have uh, the inside, inside interface, which is set to a trust level of 100. You could have a DMZ set at 50 and an outside at zero. And those varying levels of trust will determine the flow of traffic and what's allowed by default and what's denied. And the rule base that you would have to put in place as a result of those different trust levels. So in this case, we just have one arm on the inside and one arm on, on the outside. The inside being the most trusted with a security level of 100. The outside being the least trusted with a security level of zero. Our traffic is allowed out from inside to outside, flowing from the higher security to the, the higher trusted to the lower trusted. And the inverse, it will be denied. So the lower security, lower trust to higher trust is denied and will require specific rules. That doesn't apply, though, for connections that originate from the inside and go outside and are stateful. So a TCP connection, a telnet attempt, for instance, that comes through the inside to the outside of the ASA, is allowed. The ASA is going to store that connection and, and remember it and be anticipating a response from the web server or whatever external host on the outside is sending its reply back. So that particular traffic does not require a rule on the outside interface. Since it's allowed going outbound, firewall remembers it and expects a connection back stateful and the response will be allowed. You don't have to have a specific allow rule on the outside in. So now that we have the interfaces named and IP'd, should be able to ping It's, there's no access list applied, so that will not work. We'll have to go in and, uh, and get that set up before that ping starts working. Oh, we can actually see now that since the traffic was flowing from the inside interface to the outside, and it's hitting the inside zone and the outside zone, we're seeing that the traffic is passed by the router. The reason why we weren't seeing this before is it, it wasn't matching the rule. We had set uh, we we set it up for the inside to outside zone, not from the inside to the self zone. So the router, the IPs on the router itself is known as the self zone. And when I, when I was pinging the fast Ethernet 1.0 IP, it was seeing that as a connection from the inside to the self zone. But now, since I'm pinging through the router into the inside interface of the ASA, we can see that that traffic is now being logged. And if I go into the monitor tab again, we should be able to, yep, now we can see the packets, the allowed packets incrementing here. We can see the policy map, which is being matched. And if there are any sort of active sessions, which there is, but we would have, to, oh, it's not. We may not see it as an active session since there's no response coming back. Or it could also be denied since there's no zone. There's no, let's see, we set it to allow so if we change this to inspect, yeah, it's still going to timeout.
so we can see now that the, there's an active session. When it was set to allow the connection coming back, uh, it, it wasn't establishing a connection because the connection coming back would have been denied since there was no implicit, there was no allow on the on the out from the outside to the inside. So the traffic was being allowed outbound, but it wasn't being stored within the state table and allowed back. It was just it was just denied being dropped. So we'll we'll let that ping continue. And we'll go back over to the ASA where we will continue the configuration. In order to uh, allow management through the ASDM, we need to set up the HTTP server and specify which host can access the HTTP server. It's a very simple command, it's HTTP server, enable. And we can either leave this as the default port or we could change it to another port. Uh, just for the sake of tinkering with it, we'll set it to 4443 instead of 443. And then uh, the other command that we need to specify which hosts are allowed, hosts or networks are allowed to, uh, to access the HTTP server, we'll use the command HTTP, put in our IP address, network, 172.16.1.0 and slash 30 and we will be expecting this on the inside interface. So we'll be, we'll, our, our connections will be terminating on the inside interface of the ASA. If I do a show route, see there's no route back to the 172.16, so it may also be contributing to why the traffic is failing. And it, it could be making it to the ASA, but the ASA doesn't know how to get back. So we'll go ahead and put a route in for the 172.16.1.0. One Inside one seven two sixteen one zero and we will use the one nine two one six eight two dot one as our next hop, which is the outside interface of router one. Ah, okay, that 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 was it. So that was the reason why our traffic was failing. And I had no route back. So now if I do a show route, you can see the, the static entry here via the inside interface. Now we need to specify which ASDM image is used. If you remember, that was the first thing that we talked about here, but we'll use the command ASDM image it's on disk zero and this is our file name now when I go to launch the ASDM now I do this as uh, the administrator as well when I'm launching the ASDM see if there's a username already configured. There is, it's admin and the password is admin. We can see the IP address. I, uh, I've used this in other labs, so it was already populated, but you just put in the IP address and if there's a custom port, use the colon and specify the port number. 